Episode 155. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, now, from deep in the darkest forests of northern Minnesota, the show you waited for, this is Grizzly's Loud, and I am honored to present our host, the man, the mystery, the legend, this is Grizzly. Hello and uh, welcome back and uh, happy Easter. Actually, it's the morning after Easter right now, but happy Easter anyway. I decided to record, if I can manage it, another chapter of uh, uh, The Everlasting Man. I have been obsessing a little bit about my podcast stats and who's listening and who's not listening and how many are listening. and It's been kind of pointless. It's, It's been thoroughly pointless, let's be honest. So... Rather appropriately, I think for an Easter weekend, I'm going to continue with the project of the Everlasting Man, because that seems to inspire more interest in the uh, than swinging doors. Although either hard to tell of either, because nobody comments on either of them. He said, pouting piteously. So on to chapter two of part one, and uh, hope you enjoy it to the extent it can be enjoyed. The Everlasting Man by Gilbert Keith Chesterton Read by David Grizzly Smith Part 1 On the Creature Called Man Chapter 2 Professors and Prehistoric Men Science is weak about these prehistoric things in a way that has hardly been noticed. The science whose modern marvels we all admire succeeds by incessantly adding to its data. In all practical inventions, in most natural discoveries, it can always increase evidence by experiment. But it cannot experiment in making men, or even in watching to see what the first men make. An inventor can advance step by step in the construction of an aeroplane, even if he is only experimenting with sticks and scraps of metal in his own backyard. But he cannot watch the missing link evolving in his own backyard. If he has made a mistake in his calculations, the aeroplane will correct it by crashing to the ground. But if he has made a mistake about the arboreal habits of his ancestor... He cannot see his arboreal ancestor falling off the tree. He cannot keep a caveman like a cat in the backyard and watch him to see whether he does really practice cannibalism or carry off his mates on the principles of marriage by capture. He cannot keep a tribe of primitive men like a pack of hounds and notice how far they are influenced by the herd instinct. If he sees a particular bird behave in a particular way, he can get other birds and see if they behave in that way. But if he finds a skull, or the scrap of a skull in the hollow of a hill, he cannot multiply it into a vision of the valley of dry bones. In dealing with a past that has almost entirely perished, he can only go by evidence and not by experiment. And there is hardly enough evidence to be even evidential. Thus, while most science moves in a sort of curve, being constantly corrected by new evidence, this science flies off into space in a straight line uncorrected by anything. But the habits of forming conclusions, as they can really be formed in more fruitful fields, 
is so fixed in the scientific mind that it cannot resist talking like this. It talks about the idea suggested by one scrap of bone, as if it were something like the aeroplane, which is constructed at last out of whole scrap peeps of scraps of metal. The trouble with the professor of the prehistoric is that he cannot scrap his scrap. The marvelous and triumphant aeroplane is made out of a hundred mistakes. The student of origins can only make one mistake and stick to it. We talk very truly of the patience of science, but in this department it would be truer to talk of the impatience of science. Owing to the difficulty above described, the theorist is in far too much of a hurry. We have a series of hypotheses so hasty that they may well be called fancies, and cannot in any case be further corrected by facts. The most empirical anthropologist is here as limited as an antiquary. He can only cling to a fragment of the past and has no way of increasing it for the future. He can only clutch his fragment of fact, almost as the primitive man clutched his fragment of flint, and, indeed, he does deal with it in much the same way and for much the same reason. It is his tool, and his only tool. It is his weapon and his only weapon. He often wields it with a fanaticism far in excess of anything shown by men of science when they can collect more facts from experience, and even add new facts by experiment. Sometimes the professor with his bone becomes almost as dangerous as a dog with his bone, and the dog at least does not deduce a theory from it, proving that mankind is going to the dogs, or that it came from them. For instance, I have pointed out the difficulty of keeping a monkey and watching it evolve into a man. Experimental evidence of such an evolution being impossible, the professor is not content to say, as most of us would be ready to say, that such an evolution is likely enough anyhow. He produces his little bone, or little collection of bones, and deduces the most marvelous things from it. He found in Java a piece of skull, seeming by its contour to be smaller than the human. Somewhere near it he found an upright thigh bone, and in the same scattered fashion some teeth that were not human. If they all form part of one creature, which is doubtful, our conception of the creature would be almost equally doubtful. But the effect on popular science was to produce a complete and even complex figure. Finished down to the last details of hair and habits, he was given a name, as if he were an ordinary historical character. People talked of Pithecanthropus, as of Pitt or Fox or Napoleon. Popular history has published portraits of him, like the portraits of Charles I and George IV. A detailed drawing was reproduced, carefully shaded, to show that the very hairs of his head were all numbered. No uninformed person looking at the carefully lined face and wistful eyes would imagine for a moment that this was the portrait of a thigh bone, or of a few teeth and a fragment of a cranium. In the same way, people talked about him as if he were an individual whose influence and character were familiar to us all. I have just read a story in a magazine about Java and how modern white inhabitants of that island are prevailed on to misbehave themselves by the personal influence of poor old Pithecanthropus, and that the modern inhabitants of Java misbehave themselves I can very readily believe, but I do not imagine that they need any encouragement from the discovery of a few highly doubtful bones. Anyhow, those bones are far too few and fragmentary and dubious to fill up the whole of the vast void that does in reason and in reality lie between man and his bestial ancestors, if they were his ancestors. On the assumption of that evolutionary connection, a connection which I am not in the least concerned to deny, the really arresting and remarkable fact is the comparative absence of any such remains recording that connection at that point. The sincerity of Darwin really admitted this, and that is how we came to use such a term as the missing link. 
But the dogmatism of Darwinians has been too strong for the agnosticism of Darwin, and men have insensibly fallen into turning this entirely negative term into a positive image. They talk of searching for the habits and habitat of the missing link, as if one were to talk of being on friendly terms with the gap in a narrative, or the hole in an argument, of taking a walk with an unsequitur, or dining with an undistributed middle. In this sketch, therefore, of man in his relation to certain religious and historical problems, I shall waste no further space on these speculations on the nature of man before he became man. His body may have been evolved from the roots, but we know nothing of any such transition that throws the smallest light upon his soul as it has shown itself in history. Unfortunately, the same school of writers pursue the same style of reasoning when they come to the first real evidence about the first real men. Strictly speaking, of course, we know nothing about prehistoric man for the simple reason that he was prehistoric. The history of prehistoric man is a very obvious contradiction in terms. It is the sort of unreason in which only rationalists are allowed to indulge. If a parson had casually observed that the flood was antediluvian, it is possible that he might be a little chaffed about his logic. If a bishop were to say that Adam was pre-Adamite, we might think it a little odd. But we are not supposed to notice such verbal trifles as when skeptical historians talk of the part of history that is prehistoric. The truth is that they are using the terms historic and prehistoric without any clear test or definition in their minds. What they mean is that there are traces of human lives before the beginning of human stories, and in that sense we do at least know that humanity was before history. Human civilization is older than human records. That is the sane way of stating our relations to these remote things. Humanity has left examples of its other arts earlier than the art of writing, or at least of any writing that we can read. But it is certain that the primitive arts were arts, and it is in every way probable that the primitive civilizations were civilizations. The man left a picture of the reindeer, but he did not leave a narrative of how he hunted the reindeer, and therefore what we can say of him is hypothesis, not history. But the art he did practice was quite artistic. His drawing was quite intelligent, and there is no reason to doubt that his story of the hunt would be quite intelligent, only if it exists it is not intelligible. In short, the prehistoric period need not mean the primitive period in the sense of the barbaric or bestial period. It does not mean the time before civilization or the time before arts and crafts. It simply means the time before any connected narratives that we can read. This does indeed make all the practical difference between remembrance and forgetfulness, but it is perfectly possible that there were all sorts of forgotten forms of civilization, as well as all sorts of forgotten forms of barbarism. And in any case, everything indicated that many of these forgotten or half-forgotten social stages were much more civilized and much less barbaric than is vulgarly imagined today. But even about these unwritten histories of humanity, when humanity was quite certainly human, we can only conjecture, with the greatest doubt and caution. And unfortunately, doubt and caution are the last things commonly encouraged by the loose evolutionism of the current culture. For that culture is full of curiosity, and the one thing that it cannot endure is the agony of agnosticism. <laughs> it was in the Darwinian age that the word first became known and the thing first became impossible. It is necessary to say plainly that all this ignorance is simply covered by impudence. Statements are made so plainly and positively that men have hardly the moral courage to pause upon them and find that they're without support. The other day, a scientific summary of the state of a prehistoric tribe began confidently with the words, "'They wore no clothes.' Not one reader in a hundred probably stopped to ask himself how we should come to know whether clothes had once been worn by people of whom everything has perished except a few chips of bone and stone. 
It was doubtless hoped that we should find the stone hats, as well as the stone hatchet. It was evidently anticipated that we might discover an everlasting pair of trousers of the same substance as the everlasting rock. But, to persons of a less sanguine temperament, it will be immediately apparent that people might wear simple garments, or even highly ornamental garments, without leaving any more traces of them than these people have left. The plating of rushes and grasses, for instance, might have become more and more elaborate without in the least becoming more eternal. One civilization might specialize in things that happen to be perishable, like weaving and embroidery, and not in things that happen to be more permanent, like architecture and sculpture. There have been plenty of examples of such specialist societies. A man of the future finding the ruins of our factory machinery might as fairly say that we were acquainted with iron, and with no other substance, and announce the discovery that the proprietor and manager of the factory undoubtedly walked about naked, or possibly wore iron hats and trousers. It is not contended here that these primitive men did wear clothes, any more than they did weave rushes, but merely that we do not have enough evidence to know whether they did or not. But... It may be worth while to look back for a moment at some of the very few things that we do know, and that they did do. If we consider them, we shall certainly not find them inconsistent with such ideas as dress and decoration. We do not know whether they decorated other things. We do not know whether they had embroideries, and if they had the embroideries, could not be expected to have remained. But we do know that they did have pictures, and the pictures have remained and there remains with them, as already suggested, the testimony to something that is absolute and unique, that belongs to man, and to nothing else except man, that is a difference of kind, and not a difference of degree. A monkey does not draw clumsily in a man cleverly. A monkey does not begin the art of representation in a man carried to perfection. A monkey does not do it at all. He does not begin to do it at all. He does not begin to begin to do it at all. A line of some kind is crossed before the first faint line can begin. Another distinguished writer, again, in commenting on the cave drawings attributed to the Neolithic men of the reindeer period, said that none of their pictures appeared to have any religious purpose, and he seemed almost to infer that they had no religion. I can hardly imagine a thinner thread of argument than this, which reconstructs the very inmost moods of the prehistoric mind from the fact that somebody who had scrawled a few sketches on a rock, from what motive we do not know, for what purpose we do not know, acting under what customs or conventions we do not know, may possibly have found it easier to draw reindeer than to draw religion. He may have drawn it because it was his religious symbol, he may have drawn it because it was not his religious symbol. He may have drawn anything except his religious symbol. He may have drawn his real religious symbol somewhere else, or it may have been deliberately destroyed when it was drawn. He may have done or not done half a million things, but in any case it is an amazing leap of logic to infer that he had no religious symbol, or even to infer from his having no religious symbol, that he had no religion. Now this particular case happens to illustrate the insecurity of these guesses very clearly. For a little while afterwards people discovered not only paintings but sculptures of animals in the caves. Some of these were said to be damaged, with dents or holes supposed to be the marks of arrows and the damaged images were conjectured to be the remains of some magic rite of killing the beasts in effigy, while the undamaged images were explained in connection with another magic rite invoking fertility upon the herds. Here again there is something faintly humorous about the scientific habit of having it both ways. If the image is damaged, it proves one superstition, and if it is undamaged, it proves another. Here again there is a rather reckless jumping to conclusions, it has hardly occurred to the speculators that a crowd of hunters imprisoned in winter in a cave might conceivably have aimed at a mark for fun. 
as a sort of primitive parlor game. But in any case, if it was done out of superstition, what has become of the thesis that it had nothing to do with religion? <laughs> the truth is that all this guesswork has nothing to do with anything. It is not half such a good parlor game as shooting arrows at a carved reindeer, for it is shooting them into the air. Such speculators rather tend to forget, for instance, that men in the modern world also sometimes make marks in caves. When a crowd of trippers is conducted through the labyrinth of the marvelous grotto or the magic stalactite cavern, it has been observed that hieroglyphics spring into sight where they have passed. Initials and inscriptions, which the learned refuse to refer to any remote date. But the time will come when these inscriptions will really be of remote date. And if the professors of the future are anything like the professors of the present, they will be able to deduce a vast number of very vivid and interesting things from these cave writings of the 20th century. If I know anything about the breed, and if they have not fallen away from the full-blooded confidence of their fathers, they will be able to discover the most fascinating facts about us from the initials left in the magic grotto by Ari and Ariets, possibly in the form of two intertwined A's. From this alone they will know, one, that as the letters are rudely chipped with a blunt pocket knife, the twentieth century possessed no delicate graving tools and was unacquainted with the art of sculpture. Two, that as the letters are capital letters, their civilization never evolved any small letters or anything like a running hand. Three, that because the initial consonants stand together in an unpronounceable fashion, our language was possibly akin to Welsh, or more probably of the early Semitic type that ignored vowels. Four, that as the initials of Ari and Ariet do not in any special fashion possess to be religious symbols, our civilization possessed no religion. Perhaps the last is about the nearest to the truth, for a civilization that had religion would have a little more reason. It is commonly affirmed, again, that religion grew in a very slow and evolutionary manner, and even that it grew not from one cause, but from a combination that might be called a coincidence. Generally speaking, the three chief elements in the combination are, first, the fear of the chief of the tribe, whom Mr. Wells insists on calling with regrettable familiarity the old man, second, the phenomena of dreams, and third, the sacrificial associations of the harvest and the resurrection symbolized in the growing corn. I may remark in passing that it seems to me very doubtful, psychology, to refer one living and single spirit to three dead and disconnected causes, if they were merely dead and disconnected causes. Suppose Mr. Wells, in one of his fascinating novels of the future, were to tell us that there would arise among men a new and as yet nameless passion, of which men will dream as they dream of first love, for which they will die as they die for a flag and a fatherland. I think we should be a little puzzled if he told us that this singular sentiment would be a combination of the habit of smoking woodbines, the increase of the income tax, and the pleasure of a motorist in exceeding the speed limit. We could not easily imagine this, because we could not imagine any connection between the three, or any common feeling that would include them all, nor could anyone imagine any connection between corn and dreams, and an old chief with a spear, unless there was already a common feeling to include them all. But if there was such a common feeling, it could only be the religious feeling, and these things could not be the beginnings of religious feeling, that existed already. I think anybody's common sense will tell him that it is far more likely that this sort of mystical sentiment did exist already than that in the light of it dreams and kings and cornfields could appear mystical then, as they appear mystical now. For the plain truth is that all this is a trick of making things seem distant and dehumanized merely by pretending not to understand things that we do understand. It is like saying that prehistoric men had an ugly and uncouth habit of opening their mouths wide at intervals and stuffing strange substances into them, as if we'd never heard of eating. It is like saying that the terrible troglodytes of the Stone Age lifted alternate legs in rotation, as if we had never heard of walking. 
If it were meant to touch the mystical nerve and awaken us to the wonder of walking and eating, it might be a legitimate fancy. As it is here intended to kill the mystical nerve and deaden us to the wonder of religion, it is irrational rubbish. It pretends to find something incomprehensible in the feelings that we all comprehend. Who does not find dreams mysterious and feel that they lie on the dark borderland of being? Who does not feel the death and resurrection of the growing things of the earth as something near to the secret of the universe? Who does not understand that there must always be the savor of something sacred about authority and the solidarity that is the soul of the tribe? If there be any anthropologist who really finds these things remote and impossible to realize, we can say nothing of that scientific gentleman except that he has not got so large and enlightened a mind as a primitive man. To me it seems obvious that nothing but a spiritual sentiment already active could have clothed these separate and diverse things with sanctity. To say that religion came from reverencing a chief or sacrificing at a harvest is to put a highly elaborate cart before a really primitive horse. It is like saying that the impulse to draw pictures came from the contemplation of the pictures of reindeers in the cave. In other words, it is explaining painting by saying that it arose out of the work of painters, or accounting for art by saying it arose out of art. It is even more like saying that the thing we call poetry arose as the result of certain customs, such as that of an ode being officially composed to celebrate the advent of spring, or that of a young man rising at a regular hour to listen to the skylark, and then writing his report on a piece of paper. It is quite true that young men often become poets in the spring, and it is quite true that when once there are poets, no mortal power can restrain them from writing about the skylark. But the poems did not exist before the poets. The poetry did not arise out of the poetic forms. In other words, it is hardly an adequate explanation of how a thing appeared for the first time to say that it existed already. Similarly, we cannot say that religion arose out of the religious forms, because that is only another way of saying that it only arose when it existed already. It needed a certain sort of mind to see that there was anything mystical about the dreams or the dead, as it needed a particular sort of mind to see that there was anything poetical about the skylark or the spring. That mind was presumably what we call the human mind, very much as it existed to this day, for mystics still meditate upon death and dreams as poets still write about spring and skylarks. But there is not the faintest hint to suggest that anything short of the human mind we know feels any of these mystical associations at all. A cow in a field seems to derive no lyrical impulse or instruction from her unrivaled opportunities for listening to the skylark. And similarly, there is no reason to suppose that live sheep will ever begin to use dead sheep as the basis of a system of elaborate ancestor worship. It is true that in the spring a young quadruped's fancy might lightly turn to thoughts of love, but no succession of springs has ever led it to turn, however lightly, to thoughts of literature. And in the same way, while it is true that a dog has dreams, while most other quadrupeds do not seem even to have that, we have waited a long time for the dog to develop his dreams into an elaborate system or religious ceremonial. We have waited so long that we have really ceased to expect it, and we no more look to see a dog apply his dreams to ecclesiastical construction than to see him examine his dreams by the rules of psychoanalysis. It is obvious, in short, that, for some reason or other, these natural experiences, even natural excitements, never do pass the line that separates them from creative expression like art and religion in any creature except man. They never do. They never have. And it is now, to all appearance, very improbable that they ever will. It is not impossible, 
in the sense of self-contradictory, that we should see cows fasting from grass every Friday or going on their knees as in the old legend about Christmas Eve. It is not in that sense impossible that cows should contemplate death until they can lift up a sublime psalm of lamentation to the tune of the old cow died of. It is not in that sense impossible that they should express their hopes of a heavenly career in a symbolic dance in honor of the cow that jumped over the moon. It may be that the dog will at last have laid in a sufficient store of dreams to enable him to build a temple to Cerberus as a sort of canine trinity. It may be that his dreams have already begun to turn into visions capable of verbal expression in some revelation about the dog star as the spiritual home for lost dogs. These things are logically possible, in the sense that it is logically difficult to prove the universal negative which we call an impossibility. But all oh, that instinct for the probable, which we call common sense, must long ago have told us that the animals are not, to all appearance, evolving in that sense, and that, to say the least, we are not likely to have any personal evidence of their passing from the animal experience to the human experiments. But spring, and death, and even dreams, considered merely as experiences, are their experiences as much as ours. The only possible conclusion is that these experiences, considered as experiences, do not generate anything like a religious sense in any mind except a mind like ours. We come back to the fact of a certain kind of mind that was already alive and alone. It was unique, and it could make creeds as it could make cave drawings. The materials for religion had lain there for countless ages, like the materials for everything else. But the power of religion was in the mind. Man could already see in these things the riddles and hints and hopes that he still sees in them, he could not only dream, but dream about dreams. He could not only see the dead, but see the shadow of death, and was possessed with that mysterious mystification that forever finds death incredible. It is quite true that we have even these hints chiefly about man when he unmistakably appears as man. We cannot affirm this or anything else about the alleged animal originally connecting man and the brutes. But that is only because he is not an animal, but an allegation. We cannot be certain the pithecanthropus ever worshipped, because we cannot be certain that he ever lived. He is only a vision, called up to fill the void that does in fact yawn between the first creatures who were certainly men and any other creatures that are certainly apes or other animals. A few very doubtful fragments are scraped together to suggest such an intermediate creature because it is required by a certain philosophy. But nobody supposes that these are sufficient to establish anything philosophical even in support of that philosophy. A scrap of skull found in Java cannot establish anything about religion or about the absence of religion. If there ever was any such ape man, he may have exhibited as much ritual in religion as a man, or as much simplicity in religion as an ape. He may have been a mythologist, or he may have been a myth. It might be interesting to inquire whether this mystical quality appeared in a transition from the ape to the man, if there were really any types of the transition to inquire about. In other words, the missing link might or might not be mystical if he were not missing. But compared with the evidence we have of real human beings, we have no evidence that he was a human being or a half-human being or a being at all. Even the most extreme evolutionists do not attempt to deduce any evolutionary views about the origin of religion from him. Even in trying to prove that religion grew slowly from rude or irrational sources, they began their proof with the first men who were men. But their own proof only proves that the men who were already men were already mystics. 
They used the rude and the rational elements as only men and mystics can use them. We come back once more to the simple truth, that at some time too early for these critics to trace, a transition had occurred to which bones and stones cannot, in their nature, bear witness, and man became a living soul. Touching this matter of the origin of religion, the truth is that those who are thus trying to explain it are trying to explain it away. Subconsciously, they feel that it looks less formidable when thus lengthened out into a gradual and almost invisible process. But, in fact, this perspective entirely falsifies the reality of experience. They bring together two things that are totally different, the stray hints of evolutionary origins and the solid and self-evident block of humanity, and try to shift their standpoint till they see them in a single foreshortened line. But it is an optical illusion. Men do not, in fact, stand related to monkeys or missing links in any such chain as that in which men stand related to men. There may have been intermediate creatures whose faint traces can be found here and there in the huge gap of these beings, if they ever existed. It may be true that they were things very unlike men or men very unlike ourselves, but of prehistoric men, such as those called the cave men or the reindeer men, it is not true in any sense whatever. Prehistoric men of that sort were things exactly like men, and men exceedingly like ourselves. They only happen to be men about whom we do not know much for the simple reason they have left no records or chronicles. But all that we do know about them makes them just as human and ordinary as men in a medieval manner or a Greek city. Looking from our human standpoint up the long perspective of humanity, we simply recognize this thing as human. If we had to recognize it as animal, we should have had to recognize it as abnormal. If we chose to look through the other end of the telescope, as I have done more than once in these speculations, if we chose to project the human figure forward out of an unhuman world, we could only say that one of the animals had obviously gone mad. But... Seeing the thing from the right end, or rather from the inside, we know it is sanity, and we know that these primitive men were sane. We hail a certain human Freemasonry wherever we see it, in savages, in foreigners, or in historical characters. For instance, all we can infer from primitive legend, and all we know of barbaric life, supports a certain moral and even mystical idea of which the commonest symbol is clothes. For clothes are very literally vestments, and man wears them because he is a priest. It is true that even as an animal he is here different from the animals. Nakedness is not nature to him. It is not his life, but rather his death, even in the vulgar sense of his death of cold. <laughs> but clothes are worn for dignity or decency or decoration where they are not in any way wanted for warmth. It would sometimes appear that they are valued for ornament before they are valued for use. It would almost always appear that they are felt to have some connection with decorum. Conventions of this sort vary a great deal with various times and places, and there are some who cannot get over this reflection and for whom it seems a sufficient argument for letting all conventions slide. They never tire of repeating with simple wonder that dress is different in the Cannibal Islands and in Camden Town, and they cannot get any further and throw up the whole idea of decency in despair. They might as well say that because there have been hats of a good many different shapes, and some other eccentric shapes, therefore hats do not matter, or do not exist. They would probably add there is no such thing as sunstroke or going bald, Men have felt everywhere that certain norms were necessary to fence off and protect certain private things from contempt or coarse misunderstanding, and the keeping of those forms, whatever they were, made for dignity and mutual respect. 
The fact that they mostly refer, more or less remotely, to the relations of the sexes illustrates the two facts that must be put at the very beginning of the record of the race. The first is the fact that original sin is really original, not merely in theology, but in history. It is a thing rooted in the origins. Whatever else men have believed, they have all believed that there is something the matter with mankind. This sense of sin has made it impossible to be natural and have no clothes, just as it has made it impossible to be natural and have no laws. But above all, it is to be found in that other fact, which is the father and mother of all laws, as it is itself founded on a father and mother, the thing that is before all thrones and even all commonwealths. That fact is the family. Here again, we must keep the enormous proportions of a normal thing clear of various modifications and degrees and doubts, more or less reasonable, like clouds clinging about a mountain. It may be that what we call the family had to fight its way from or through various anarchies and aberrations, but it certainly survived them, and is quite as likely as not to have also preceded them. As we shall see in the case of communism and nomadism, more formless things could and did lie in the flank of societies that had taken a fixed form, but there is nothing to show that the form did not exist before formlessness. What is vital is that form is more important than formlessness, and that the material called mankind has taken this form. For instance, of the rules revolving around sex, which were recently mentioned, none is more curious than the savage custom commonly called the kuvad. That seems like a law out of topsy-turvydom, by which the father is treated as if he were the mother. In any case, it clearly involves the mystical sense of sex, but many have maintained that it is really a symbolic act by which the father accepts the responsibility of fatherhood. In that case, that grotesque antic is really a very solemn act, for it is the foundation of all we call the family, and all we know is human society. Some, groping in these dark beginnings, have said that mankind was once under a matriarchy. I suppose that under a matriarchy it would not be called mankind, but womankind. But others have conjectured that what is called matriarchy was simply moral anarchy, in which the mother alone remained fixed because all the fathers were fugitive and irresponsible. Then came the moment when the man decided to guard and guide what he had created. So he became the head of the family, not as a bully with a big club to beat women with, but rather as a respectable person trying to be a responsible person. Now all that might be perfectly true, and might even have been the first family act, and it would still be true that man then for the first time acted like a man, and therefore the for the first time became fully a man. But it might quite as well be true that the matriarchy, or moral anarchy, or whatever we call it, was only one of the hundred social disillusions and barbaric backslidings which may have occurred at intervals in prehistoric as they certainly did in historic times. A symbol like the Kuvad, if it was really such a symbol, may have commemorated the suppression of a heresy, rather than the first rise of religion. We cannot conclude with any certainty about these things except in their big results in the building of mankind, but we can say in what style the bulk of it and the best of it is built. We can say that the family is the unit of the state, that it is the cell that makes up the formation. Round the family do indeed gather the sanctities that separate men from ants and bees. Decency is the curtain of that tent. Liberty is the wall of that city. Property is but the family farm. Honor is but the family flag. In the practical proportions of human history, we come back to that fundamental of the father and the mother and the child. It has been said already 
that if this story cannot start with religious assumptions, it must nonetheless start with some moral or metaphysical assumptions, or no sense can be made of the story of man. And this is a very good instance of that alternative necessity. If we are not of those who begin by invoking a divine trinity, we must nonetheless invoke a human trinity, and see that triangle repeated everywhere in the pattern of the world. For the highest event in history to which all history looks forward and leads up is only something that is at once the reversal and renewal of that triangle. Or rather, it is the one triangle superimposed so as to intersect the other, making a sacred pentacle of which, in a mightier sense than that of the magicians, the fiends are afraid. The old trinity was a father and mother and child, and is called the human family. The new is of child and mother and father, and has the name of the holy family. It is in no way altered, except in being entirely reversed, just as the world which is transformed was not in the least different, except in being turned upside down. Thank you for listening to The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton, read by me, David Grizzly Smith. Theme music for this book is Deliberate Thoughts by Kevin MacLeod of Rencompetech.com. This book is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 License. That means please make copies, please share this book, but don't change it, don't sell it, and do tell people where you got it. If you like this book, leave a comment on grizzly.libsyn.com. Leave a comment or rating on patiobooks.com or anywhere else you can. Blog about it, podcast about it, tweet about it, tell everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Grizzly's Growls, the life and times of a minor local celebrity. If you like the show, tell your friends. If you don't like the show, tell your enemies. If this podcast lasts more than four hours, see your doctor. Theme music is Hot Swing from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or at feeds.feedburner.com slash grizzlies growls. Comment at grizzly.libsyn.com or by voicemail at the comment line 218-234-CALL. That's 218-234-2255. These shows are released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 License. Your mileage may vary.